<laughs> so um, we're here today to talk about imperialism, and I just want to put that lay the groundwork. And um, um, Scott is going to do a much better, more detailed job with that. And um, I just want to say that people's interest uh, right now is strong in what's happening in the Middle East because of this horrific uh, uh, in slaughter in uh, Gaza that's happened over the last week. And uh, nearly 2,000 people have been killed in Palestine, and nobody has attempted to stop the perpetrators of this crime in any way. And they've had a great deal of cover from our own government, which takes us to our subject of imperialism. And um, I just want to say that our government presents itself as a friend of Israel, but if your friend went crazy and walked into a crowded cafe and uh, with a high caliber weapon start shooting at people, would you like hand him a new clip when the first one is empty or would you try to stop them? Because that's really the issue here. And um, so uh, at least uh, it's slowed down and stopped for now, but it's a pretty horrible thing. And um, we're going to talk uh, also about Syria where more than 2,000 people have been killed uh, by uh, something that began as a um, began uh, as a, an internal insurrection, uh, although certainly uh, assisted by external forces, and now it's been overrun by foreign fighters. And then we'll talk a little about Iraq, which is so weak after 10 years of violence and a million people killed that uh, it's easy. Uh, to be over, it's easily overrun by um, by violence and uh, fighters. So I'm just going to allow this to go on. Uh, I'm going to move on with our presentation. I'd like to hear what Scott has to say, but I just want to introduce him. And this is I'm Judy Bellow. I live here in Rochester. I'm a member of Rochester Against War. I'm a member of other organizations, the Upstate Drone Coalition. And uh, this is Scott Williams, and Scott lives in Philadelphia. Scott and I traveled to Syria uh, in early June as election observers. It was a fascinating experience, which uh, really binds our story together. And uh, Scott is with an organization called FIST, um, Fight Imperialism, Stand Together. And uh, it's wonderful uh, to see him uh, active in a political organization that's really strong. And uh, so I'm going to give the floor to Scott. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm you might have to set it on something like your leg or something. All right, great. Well. I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. It's great to be here in Rochester. Again, my name is Scott Williams with FIST and the International Action Center. So as you can tell, we tried to connect the issues of Gaza, Syria, and Iraq. Ideally, we'd like to also connect you know, Ukraine, Venezuela, you know, events going on in every continent of the world where the US is involved and where the US can only really bring more misery to these people. Um, I wanted to start off with a map just because you know, I study geography and I hope that people learn and like to read and, and understand where the world, where in the world are we. Um, we're going to be mostly talking about Syria. Um, mostly, most of our time is here at Damascus, which is the oldest city in the world. Um, and of course, Iraq. And then this map, this kind of incorrectly, it says Israel here. We should probably have it say Palestine. But um, we're going to be connecting these issues here. and. Feel, please, you know, throughout this presentation at any time, feel free to stop me. I'm going to have any questions about something you see here in particular. So, as Judy said, we are talking about imperialism. And I'm imagining that most of you have, a, have an understanding of what that term means. I know that a lot of times it's used as a, a period of time for U.S. foreign policy in the early 20th century where the U.S. conquered, you know, the Philippines, Puerto Rico, and Guam, and a handful in Hawaii, and a handful of other islands. But in fact, imperialism is an entire economic system. It's not, it's not about foreign policy, or a particular policy, or a particular party. It is about the economic system of capitalism developing to a point at which monopolies control every single industry, 
I believe you had what, Kodak and Xerox here, but you've had monopolies in every single industry which seek to dominate and control. And these, kind of, these companies are not, and them together with the banks, are not happy with just selling to people in the United States. They need to control markets and resources and everything about the entire world. They need to expand or die. And that's really the role of imperialism, and that's and the role of the United States government along with that is to facilitate that process. Um, and we like to say that the, the dollar follows the flag and the flag follows the dollar. That's the really, what is the role of the United States military, of, of all the weapons, of all the bombs, of all the drones, of everything the United States president does, no matter what party they're from, it is about supporting the imperialists. And we say that the United States is the primary imperialist power. They, versus all, basically versus any other force in the world, the United States imperialists are the number one enemy of humanity. And this is the primary problem for humanity today. Um, so, this is, I'm using this kind of kitschy term here to, to go through connecting Gaza, Syria, and Iraq. And this is what I like to call the basics of imperialist war. Um, we start with democracy, dictators, and terrorists. Then we're going to go into divide and conquer, and uh, economic and military strangulation. And then we'll end with the big lie, and then we'll connect a little bit more about our trip. Uh, so, democracy, dictators, and terrorists. I'm sure it's not just George W. Bush who used these terms. <laughs> we see it pretty much every single day. Um, these people are referred, primarily these two on the left are, are dictators, where the U.S. is fighting for democracy. This is the President Assad on the left of Syria, and then in the middle, um, Saddam Hussein. And then terrorists. This is the leader of Hamas. And if you read anything in the New York Times, or many of CNN or Fox News, they'll all say the terrorist group or the militant Hamas or the violent, horrible, you know, some way of implying it's Israel versus Hamas. <laughs> you know, it's, it is to paint the picture that the enemy of U.S. imperialism is it's subhuman, it's horrible, and they can only do horrible things, and the U.S. therefore must invade, it must in any way, by any means necessary, destroy that government. And we believe that this tendency is shown in every war, and, and we know, I mean, really, we know how to respond to this, I mean, we, and we're fighting within our own movement about how to respond to these threats. So democracy, I just took this as a screenshot about the so-called um, Arab Spring, where the United States imperialism tries to hide the fact that tremendous rebellions happen in countries like Yemen, you know, Egypt, Bahrain, Tunisia. Um, you know, uh, people's movements did start in Syria at some point, um, and, but they've, they've been completely manipulated, like you said. Um, and then another book, throughout the region, there's kind of a blanket term that we were, the people were fighting for democracy, the people were fighting for, you know, freedom, um, and the people were fighting for themselves. And, and basically, people were fighting against the policies that were enacted by their governments that, because they were forced to compromise and forced to compromise the independence of those countries to U.S. imperialism and, and making you know, budget cuts or austerity cuts because of for a variety of reasons and people don't have control over the resources and the money that, that into, comes from their own country. So, when I, I think we can all remember Iraq, I think is another perfect time when we can think of democracy. I think we can think of many other wars where the U.S. has been fighting for what they call democracy. Um, another point on the terrorist question is the question of Hamas. And I really want to stress this very importantly because the United States government is hell-bent on, on making, on, on, on criminalizing Hamas. And what is their crime? Their crime is winning the 2006 election. The crime is, is, is standing up. The crime is, is, is really fighting back by any means they can against the imperialists. And whether you like it or not, they are the leaders of the Palestinian resistance. This is their demands. I like to put these up because I think they're so rational and they're so basic. And, and it shows you that they are fighting for the independence and the freedom of their country. All right. So, our question for each one of these, I want to, I want to ask, you know, what is our response to the tactic of, of, of really 
leveling horrible you know, lies and, and negative propaganda towards these leaders of these countries. And how do we respond? Are we there to echo the response? Are we there to say, oh yeah, like, you know, pretty bad guy, I think he's, yeah, he's got to go. And is, our, is our response to say, oh no, he's really great. I, I, mean, I don't think that it's a, to me, the question is, to put the question back on the U.S. Imperials. What is, what is the purpose of this? Why are you doing this? What is your, why do you want to destabilize this country? What is the motive? What is the, what is the reason? And who is this going to benefit? The second tactic is divide and conquer. And this is actually a picture of the opposite of that. This is one of the great architectural feats in humanity. This is the Umayyad Mosque. This is in the center of Damascus. Um, this was built by the Umayyad dynasty in the 8th century. Um, and it was built, I mean, this is the fourth most holy site in all of Islam. Depending on who you ask, but quite, pretty much consensus that this is one of the holiest places. And it's also home to one of the holiest sites in all of Christianity. This is home to, this is John the Baptist. This is where his head is buried. Um, so we went to tour this church. and. There was this mosque and, and, and to visit this area. We saw Christians and Muslims and, and people from all over the world visiting as well. And, and it showed, in a real sense, that the, kind of the efforts to divide Sunni and Shia and divide Christians and Muslims and, and to divide and conquer these different countries is not working in Syria. They're, not, they're trying to tear apart the fabric of society, but they're failing. And we see this all over the world. You know, when you talk about Iraq, you talk about, you know, what is it, the Kurdish state versus the, I mean, the Kurdish, okay, the, 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 you know, John McCain is going as far to promote the idea that the Kurds have a state, the Shia will have a state, and the Sunnis will have a state. And I think it's probably the most preposterous thing that he could possibly do, because he is not Kurdish, nor Sunni, nor Shia, nor Iraqi, but he does not have a say in the fate of the country of Iraq. One more point on the Umayyad Mosque, this is the tallest minaret at the mosque. This is named after Jesus Christ. It was obviously a major symbol in both Christianity and Islam. And this is, I mean, this is the heart of the entire civilization. I mean, this is the heart of the, of the major cultural center of Syria. And it just shows you that, that these people are, are, not, are not opposed to one another. They're used to being together. And it's not sectarian. So, Again, we were talking about Sunni and Shia and the kind of question of whether or not to divide Iraq uh, up into different areas. We've seen, you know, in many different struggles. We, in, in the United States, we see racism. We see LGBTQ bigotry. We see, you know, sexism. We see, you know, people with disabilities being, you know, treated differently. We see a lot of different challenges. And we see a lot of these different divide and conquer tactics used by the same ruling class here, as well as all around the world. And the question is, again, what is our response to this imperialist war tactic? And I think that the people of Palestine have really responded strongly with the tactic of, of, of coming together, of uniting. And this is with Fatah and Hamas recently coming together, you know, across both the West Bank and Gaza, and saying, look. <laughs> we're looking to coordinate. We're looking to work together. We see the possibility of them pitting each other, pitting us against each other as being dangerous, as being ultimately opposed to our interests. We need to unite and fight the common oppressor, which is Israel and the United States. And so, I mean, well, that's a real source of strength. And I think that, you know, through this struggle, the Palestinians have become ultimately very victorious in this most recent period. And despite the military might of Israel, they're absolutely stood forth, you know, hands and feet above, you know, what anyone could have expected is, you know, a tremendous resistance movement. Anyways, the next tactic, and it doesn't say it here, is the economic and military strangulation, which we see all the time. You know, the most obvious could be that, you know, the United States shock and awe when they go into Iraq, if you remember that. That was the obvious, you know, military bombardment. But there was also a legacy of sanctions. You know, manipulation of currencies and of all these different economic points that really have led to the devastation. And, and what is it? It's actually 1.5 million people in Iraq have died since 1990. 
because of the United States. Um, and that begs the question in Syria, because this was the main purpose of our trip, was to expose the United States' lies, and to come from the United States to Syria to say, you know, we don't believe this, and, and we know that millions of people in the United States also don't believe the propaganda. So, the United States in Syria, what is their role? Let's make this very clear. So, they, this is the most important part, they fund, train, and arm right-wing insurgents in the billions. We're talking about 10, around $10 billion at this point. Um, they funnel money to the right-wing opposition in Syria since 2005. They do the same thing in countries like Venezuela, where they fund non so-called non-profit organizations to do their dirty work and, and, and run campaigns and actually go around killing people. And that's in Venezuela. In Syria, you know, this, is, this has all been done by a guy named Robert Ford, who is the U.S. ambassador to Damascus, who actually just recently quit his job because the U.S. is not successful. Uh, but he laid the groundwork to make the connections between these different opposition groups. And he's you know, been trained in U.S. foreign diplomacy, and, he's, and he represents you know, what the, kind of the most advanced thinking on how to set siege to a society that is opposed to the United States. So, in the past decade, they've imposed sanctions that have caused the value of the Syrian pound to plummet by 50%. They've also, you know, in so many different ways, wreaked havoc to, the, to all of the Syrian economy. Through the IMF, they've kind of forced it to, now that Syria has a stock exchange. Now Syria has actually had to privatize some aspects of its economy that were beforehand, you know, private banks. This used to all be socialized. Um, uh, in many ways, it just brought in that austerity that we talk about here, but to an extreme level to the Syrians. And that's really what led to the 2011 kind of uprising. Um, they funded exiles through a phony government called the Syrian National Council, which Judy will talk about a little bit more. Um, and the different right-wing insurgencies have, have targeted hospitals, schools, and factories, and electric companies, and water the basics of human of life. And they've done it in the most brutal ways. And, it's, and they've, not won the, the, they've not won any support amongst the people of Syria because all they've done is ruin their lives. So and we learned his stories of one of the largest like, cancer facilities in all, of, in the largest cancer facility in all Syria, which provides completely free cancer care to people of Syria, which you couldn't even imagine here in the United States. But they do that, and who, go, who has the gall to attack it? It's the right-wing opposition. It's the right-wing insurgents. They're trying to destroy what the regime, what the government provides for the people so they can weaken the support of them. Um, and they've stolen over a thousand factories from Aleppo, which is the home to the industrial kind of base, kind of the industrial heartland of, of the city, country of Syria. And they've taken those factories and operated them in Turkey and in other places all over, the, in, in some of the more rebel-controlled, insurgent-controlled territories. And they've taken over oil fields, they've taken over a lot of different things. And it's, it's really wrecked havoc. We see 50% unemployment right now in Syria. We see you know, hundreds of thousands dead because of this. Why does the U.S. want regime change? Why, why are they doing this? Why, why the, like, the military and economic strangulation? Well, obviously, it's a broader regional goal of controlling, for, you know, the question of the need to expand or die. But it also, it's because Syria has supported the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization, and also groups like the PFLP, the Marxist Lands in Palestine. Um, Syria refuses to give up its claims to the Golan Heights, which we will talk about a little bit more, but it was stolen from the of Israel. Um, Syria has strong relations with Hezbollah, we're the only army to defeat this, the Israelis, except for now the Palestinians. Of course, actually the Palestinians have consistently defeated, but the only other army to defeat Israel and also Iran. And then in the second part of the U.S. war against Iraq, Syria kind of stood clearly in opposition to the U.S. war. So, the fourth tactic of imperialist wars. I hope you all remember the first three. But the fourth is, and the final one is the big lie. It is not a mystery. The United States uses unbelievable lies to start every single war that they've ever had. I think we can all remember one very recently that was, it was called Weapons of Mass Destruction. And that was a war of total fabrication. Um, it goes back to you know, the Spanish-American War, trying to take over Cuba. That was the USS Maine. Um, Zimmerman telegram saying the Germans are going to take over 
We're going to invade through Mexico to take over the United States. Vietnam, the Gulf of Tonkin, um, you know, Grenada, um, Yugoslavia, Iraq, um, the babies in the incubators, they're saying they're unplugging them. It's totally fabrication. And then, um, you know, even with Afghanistan, you know, with the people involved in 9-11, in had really no connections with the government of Afghanistan, in terms of both. And then Libya with the lynching of Muammar Gaddafi, uh, because of the so-called, <laughs> because of a lot of the bizarre um, allegations that happened against that government. So, in Syria, the big lie is the last summer's Guta chemical attack. Now this happened. 1,400 people died in the suburbs of Damascus. This is a map. Um, but I, and, and there's actually plenty of resources online that I would encourage you to look at, because I don't have the best explanation of it here. But basically, on the 19th of August, which is two days before this chemical attack, Syria, the UN came to Syria, came to Damascus, and said, we're investigating you for using chemical weapons against your people. Two days before this, um, which was the major attack last summer. So, two, so while the UN is in Damascus, which you can see is part of the map, which is right there where the chemical attacks happen, um, you know, this is, this is this brutal attack occurs. And at this time, the Syrian government had spent two years of being harassed by the US, by other, by the NATO, and by other foreign powers because of the allegations that it was abusing the people of Syria. And I ask you all, if you were President Assad, was trying to keep you know, his government intact, would you use chemical weapons against your people if the UN was in town two days ago and had been in, and was still in town investigating you for, for using chemical weapons? Would that happen? Would you, would you do that? I think it's totally preposterous. No, but the uh, so-called rebels could um, do it. Right. They had the ability to um, launch uh, chemical weapons against the Syrian people. Um, right. Especially when the United States says this is a red line. It will, you know, exactly. It actually, the, Obama had said that it was a red line before the attack happened. So it seemed kind of convenient. Um, Global research, many other sources online will show you the clear evidence that the Syrian government did not do this, and they actually had no vested interest in doing this. And it would not, there's no, there's no way this would be helpful to, to their rule. Um, and, and it looks very clearly like Turkey helped them build this, and, he's, and with the help of Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and, or Qatar, and, and they brought it through Jordan by Al Nusra, which is um, the Al Qaeda affiliate, and they launched these attacks. And then later, the UN, <laughs> one of the leaders of the UN, uh, accused, looked into this, and accused the Syrian so called, uh, the insurgents, to having used, having done this. Which was conveniently forgotten. Just like, in, just like today, the big lie to start this crisis in Palestine was a lie about three young. Israeli children or boys being kidnapped by Palestine by Hamas. And if you look back, actually, in the last two weeks, I think, there's been stories that have been very clear that Hamas nor any of the groups in Palestine are responsible for these, these children, these kids' deaths, these Israelis' deaths. But you can look at it and look it up, and it's very clear. And so the whole war, the whole aggression was predicated on a lie that was used to, that led to the death of almost 2,000 Palestinians. Another fake out was in Hula. Um, this is a picture from the BBC News uh, later on the Telegraph. But this is a picture that was used. It's actually from Iraq. It's actually from <laughs> something the US government had done. And basically, there was 108 people dead this summer before. This was a big incident, which led to the UN condemning Syria. Um, and after looking into it, they found that these photos were all from Iraq. They weren't from Syria. This was phony. This was fake. Um, and, and that actually the Syrian government was not responsible. And there's a lot of different testimonies that the police here in the army is responsible. So, a big lie. Um, so, with those four tactics, we want to talk about what is the cost, what is the situation in Syria right now. So, since 2011, 
170,000 people have been killed. Hundreds of thousands of other people are missing. The majority, of the plurality of deaths has been Syrian Arab army soldiers. That's the government soldiers. 13,000, about no, 26,000 armed insurgents have died. 50% of those have been from outside of Syria. And they actually had political prisoners, or prisoners in Syria from 87 different countries who have been caught in Syria fighting for armed insurgencies. Groups like ISIS, FSA, Free Syrian Army, uh, Al Nusra, and a whole handful of others. Um, so it's clear that there's a call. There's an international call by these organizations to take over Syria and to kill the secular government. Um, this is Homs, which is one of the cities we went to. This is not Palestine. This is Syria today. This is actually more recent. I didn't take a picture. This was from The Guardian, but very recent picture. Um, and right now, we actually, part of our delegation went to see the rebuilding process. And they're actually going through and rebuilding the city. And they promised that they're not using one, any contractor, not one cent will go to a country like the United States, like Canada, like you know, Britain, Germany, Kuwait, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, any of these you know, the imperialists and their, and their puppets, are, they're not getting one contract to rebuild the city, you know, anything in Syria. So it's going to be great. I think Russia and China and Iran are going to help out a lot in rebuilding Syria. And this is Holmes. Truly devastated place. It was recently that the government took back control. This is these are pictures from our trip. Um, you know, of all the people who died. This is just every street, you know, lining the streets of all the dead. And in that duplicate pictures. These are just the same pictures. Um, very tragic. So again, our delegation. Um, you know, we through an Iranian nonprofit called the International Union for a Unified Homa. Um, we traveled together to Syria. That's where I met, I met Julia in the JFK airport. It was great. Um, 32 countries, including the real axis of evil. Countries like Zimbabwe. Uh, countries like North Korea. Venezuela. Bolivia. Brazil. Russia. Canada. Well, that's not an evil thing for the US. Um, Ireland, Pakistan, Bahrain. Quite a few other countries all came together to observe these elections. Activists and, and members of parliament from these countries said, decided, you know, this is very important. And it was really socialists and communists from every, from all these different countries. Um, and, you know, we, we got to sit down and, and discuss quite a bit of our trip together, as well as go through and meet a lot of the elected officials and the, and the people who ran the election. This is, again, some of the people who ran the elections. This is a fuzzy picture of the ballot. Um, there's three candidates. There's Bashar al-Assad, there's uh, al-Nuri, who's kind of a neoliberal kind of right-wing guy, and then Hajar, who's a former leader of the Communist Party, um, but it's kind of a Trotskyist group called the People's World Party. And he uh, was one of the groups that really led the protests in 2011. Um, and later, he described the calls at, <laughs> for you know, overthrowing the government and, and letting the US come in as being unrealistic and useless to try to overthrow the government at this point. So that's why they're taking part in the democratic process. Um, so the voting, uh, this election was unlike any US election. I don't know how many of you have voted in the United States. I, I don't do it that often. But um, you know, I, every time I have gone, it's, it's been very little going on. It's been kind of drab. <laughs> you see a couple of people, you see a line. Everybody's quiet. Nobody really cares. This is this voting. And actually, this is in, um, in Beirut, because 100,000 people lined up to vote in this election. And the US and other countries were saying, this is not a legitimate election. No one, we, we, and, we, and the rebels actually called our people to boycott this election. So this was the response of the people. These are refugees in Beirut who are lining up to go to the Syrian embassy to vote. And they voted for their president. Um, you can't fake this, I and mean, this is just. <laughs> This is what happened. We were there. Um, so 2.5 million refugees out of the country of, well, 2.5 million voter refugees, the 3 million refugees. Um, the, the people wanted to vote, and so it depended on what country you were in. Um, if you went to a, if you lived in a NATO country or U.S. or one of the puppet governments, um, you were not allowed to vote. But then, if you lived in any country that, you know, had some sense of 
what was going on in the world and wanted to see justice, they, they let you vote in this election. Um, and the results of the election, aside, won 88.7% of the vote. Um, it was you know, very much a, just an overwhelming support for the president. I know that that's really hard to believe for people in the United States who think of you know, multi-party democracy as being some kind of you know, preferable thing, but this is a period of crisis, and this is a period of war, and people to really, to overcome the, secular, the sectarianism, to overcome the U.S. imperialist threat of war, these people have really come together and been, been, been united in, the, in, in their and, and united behind the president, regardless of, of the serious grievances that they have with the president, which exist absolutely. You know, we've met people who, whose family members have been imprisoned by the president for political reasons, who are still very much behind the president at this point. Maybe they weren't two or three years ago, but they've changed their mind because they have to, because they know this is about survival against the U.S. This is actually my de delegation. This is the Venezuelan Syrian Friends Society. There were thousands, there were hundreds of these people with big pictures of Chavez and Maduro and some of the great leaders in Latin America. Um, and these are people who came out to visit. This is the city of Sueda where I visited on election day. The population of about 100,000. I also visited, yeah, pretty much this was my main focus. Um, you know, the voting booth, just to give you a little feel. There's me. And from the Minister of Parliament from uh, Venezuela. Uh, this is how you voted was this that ink on your hand. And that ink stayed for what? How long do you need? Weeks. <laughs> Probably two or three weeks yeah. on your finger. You have to chop off your finger if you want to vote again. Um, this is the lines. I think it's interesting because there were children voting. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But there were children at the poll which showed that, that, that people felt safe enough. So the threat was from the insurgents that. We want you to boycott the election because we're going to bomb the polling sites and we're going to attack people there. Um, and there were tons of women and children and everyone was there. Um, these are some of the guys I was with um, from Venezuela, Venezuela, Bolivia, Venezuela, and Brazil, from left to right. <laughs> They're all ministers of parliament. I am unfortunately am not a minister of any parliament. <laughs> Maybe that's okay. Um, this is the town of Sueda. This is the party outside of our hotel after President won. And actually, this was another day later. It was actually the whole entire city erupted in gunshots and just like the biggest party in the world. And we were not allowed to go to it. But it was a tremendous <laughs> moment. Uh, it was just overwhelming. It was like people were crying everywhere. You know. um, this is my last slide. And I think this is kind of speaks to the points that we that I've already raised, but it's the question is, how do we defeat the imperialist war? How, from the inside, from the belly of the beast, how do we work together to fight back and defeat the U.S. imperialism? Um, and the first is defending the right to resist by any means necessary. This means not tying the hands of the oppressed in their struggle against U.S. imperialism. Not saying, oh, I think it's fine if you uh, do this, but if you shoot rockets over there, that's bad. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> we say by any means necessary fight back and win, it's your right. Um, we need to build a mass movement to connect these wars with the conditions facing the people of the United States. Um, we're talking about budget cuts, we're talking about layoffs, we're talking about racism, we're talking about gentrification, we're talking about all these questions, and how to connect it to the fact that the United States spends 53% of its budget on war. And what does that mean for our human needs? Um, the last two parts are dispelling, okay, dispelling the propaganda, clear. Um, we've been talking about this, don't believe the lies, don't believe the hype. And kind of a short point, but it actually a massive point, is the fact that you know, capitalism and imperialism are the driving, and, 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 and the desire for profit is the driving factor behind war in the world. And it's only heightening because the U.S. ruling class is in a permanent crisis that it cannot get out of. It cannot you know, hire more people, it cannot build you know, a really profitable economy, you know, an economy that employs people. So they're deciding to go around the world and destroy the world so that they can reap some super profits throughout the world. But we realize that replacing that profit motive with a society that is run by the people, for the people, and that's the society is called socialism. That is the only future for humanity, whether it's because of U.S. wars, whether it's because the Pentagon is the number one polluter in all of the United States. 
and you're worried about the climate change, or whether it's the fact that you know there really is no future for the working class here in the United States without a revolution. And we believe that tying our fate here in the United States with the fate of the Palestinians, of the fate of the people in Syria fighting back against the U.S., is ultimately our, our, our weapon. It's turning an imperialist war into a revolutionary moment for the people of the United States to overthrow the United States government. That's my approach. That's my topic. And I'm done. Thank you.